I'm going to uh, try and simplify a lot of things. I would agree with Amanda that it's pretty complicated biology, but I'm going to try and make it simple. But if I make it simple, please don't hold us to, oh, it's such a simple problem, so why don't you have it solved? Because <laughs> we really are working on it. So we're, so we're here uh, all because we're interested in ASXL related disorders. And to spell it out, that's additional sex combs like related disorders. And just with a show of hands, I'm curious how many of you really know what sex combs are? <laughs> well, the people I used to getting big to talk know what sex combs are. <laughs> Um, so sex combs are actually a, a tiny little structure on the front legs of male fruit flies. And they are used for mating, but I think more important for us is that fruit flies have historically been a really important organism that was used by geneticists for a very long time that allowed us to really ascribe functions to certain genes. And one of the ways that they tried to figure out what different genes did was to look at how they changed uh, different eye color or shapes of legs. And in this case, one of the phenotypes or one of the changes that they uh, assessed was this change in the number of sex combs that were present on the front legs of male Drosophila. And so how there were extra sex combs or additional sex combs or polycomb in, in uh, broadly. And oftentimes um, these changes really represent dramatic changes in body shape, or uh, different cell types. In this case, you can kind of see that um, the leg is made up of different segments. You have the segment with the, with the sex comb, and then you have a different segment. And when you have duplication of the sex combs, you can see in this case that this one body, uh, this one leg segment was duplicated and oftentimes that's at the expense of some other uh, body part. And so it's a dramatic change in um, that body, body segment. And um, collectively, there were many genes that they went around and they broke all these different genes and they found many Stop genes man. that when they broke them, then they gave this uh, extra sex comb or extra leg segment. And collectively, a lot of those genes are now referred to as polycomb and polycomb genes and polycomb biology. And uh, there are a set of genes that can really have profound effects while you just have a duplication of a leg. You can also have uh, enormous substitutions. In the case of antennapedia genes, you can see you have normal antennae on the head of this Drosophila, and you can have a substitution of a leg instead of an antennae, and you can have duplications of whole body uh, portion. So in this case, you had a duplication of body segment where you know, should only have two, two wings, but now you have four. Um, the, I think that the, this is all interesting and flies are an interesting model system, but the question is, uh, do they have a, a role in human development or do they have a role in mammalian development? And uh, absolutely they do. They're conserved across many, polycomb genes are conserved across many different species. And um, in Drosophila, they just have one ASX uh, uh, gene. So one additional sex combs gene in the fly genome. But in he the human genome, 
there are three of these genes kind of emphasizing how important these genes are to development. So there are three genes in the human genome that are additional sex combs like one, additional sex combs like two, and additional sex combs like three. And they, they're, uh, they resemble each other and they tend to do some functions the same, but we think they also do some functions that are different. So how might polycomb or additional sex combs like genes be disrupting human development? So normally in development, uh, each uh, developing human starts from a mass of really similar cells. They all look the same. And in the course of say brain development, those similarly faded cells or those similar cells actually have to change in many different ways to generate all the different kinds of cells that are going to be required to develop a brain. And this happens in all organ systems, including say the GI tract, where you're going to have to take from that same group of cells and generate all the different kinds of cell types that are required to generate the uh, GI tract. So if we think about how um, some of these polycomb genes were changing the Drosophila body structures and cell types, we can apply those same principles uh, to human or any other kind of development. But in these examples, you can envision how polycomb genes, including the additional sex combs like genes, might be causing substitutions where one gene is replacing a different cell type that's closely related. You can have envision ways that one gene, uh, one cell might be entirely replaced by a totally different kind of cell. You can envision ways that these genes could actually cause some cells to just disappear in the process of development and others to be duplicated. And the question is, how might this really affect organ development in total? And if you think about uh, a, an organ, such as a brain, that brain is actually, if you look inside the brain, there are all those cells, but they actually have different numbers and they're in different locations, but these uh, numbers and locations are, are very specific and they really inform how cells in the brain make connections and communicate with each other. And if you had a change in development, such as a polycomb change, then you can envision that potentially there would be these duplications and substitutions where blue cells may take the place of some purple cells or some yellow cells, or there might be cases where some of the orange cells actually have an entirely different uh, kind of cell mixed in. And the implications of this are that this could have substantial impacts on how the cells communicate or send uh, connections to each other, or the different ratio of the number of cells could change the balance of say excitatory or inhibitory activity. And then that could be the basis of maybe why you have seizures. And that would be a practical uh, effect of polycomb uh, changes. Just to kind of hammer home, home this idea, if we consider GI development. So in the intestines, you have a number of cells that are required to actually um, absorb a lot of the nutrients that come through the intestines, but you need to keep moving that all of that food and nutrients through the intestines. And that is performed by layers of muscles. 
that have different orientations so they can push the, the food through. And you can imagine that if one of those muscle layers had fewer cells, then you could have a lot of uncoordinated movements because the two layers can't coordinate. And if both of them had fewer cells, then you would just have a, a, slow, a slowing of how much uh, capability the intestines were of actually moving that food through. So these are just, uh, these are just ideas. It would be great if we had the, um, the data already that showed that these were the case, but these are examples of how changes in polycomb could um, actually lead to um, the clinical features that are observed uh, associated with a lot of the ASXL disorders. Um, specifically, we haven't even talked about ASXLs yet. So I'm going to be um, very uh, simple in how I think about how ASXLs are actually changing all of these different cells in development. So um, each of the ASXL uh, uh, genes encode ASXL1, 2, and 3. And these genes are important for activating um, BAP1 so that together they can become the PR dub, which is the polycomb repressive deubiquitination complex. So I already explained kind of what polycomb is. And if I said it's a polycomb complex, I think you would get the idea that it's going to um, change cells and body shapes or body structures. However, what does repressive and deubiquitination mean? So um, to really get at that, you have to think about DNA. And uh, DNA is actually packaged around these, we call them nucleosomes, but they're essentially balls of proteins that can package pro uh, up DNA. So it keeps it organized in the cell so you can kind of activate or turn on or repress or turn off genes in a systematic way. And um, one of the ways that this, uh, how we are able to turn on and off genes within the context of these balls of, uh, of, of uh, protein is by uh, changing or ubiquitinating these uh, balls. And ubiquitin is just a mark and it's a repressive mark. So that's where the repressive means. And it just means that it's gonna turn off genes that are nearby the nucleosomes that have that repressive mark. And um, so this is an important mark and it is placed by the polycomb repressive complex one. And this, and being able to move this mark around between different nucleosomes, so different genes can be activated or repressed in different ways, then you need to be able to also remove it. And that is the role of PR dub. It deubiquitinates, so it takes the, that ubiquitin mark off, and that ubiquitin is repressive. So it's a repressive deubiquitination complex. And um, so to kind of like connect the development with the gene regulation, then um, you have to uh, think about how ubiquitin might be regulating genes, ubiquitin being placed by PRC1 and removed by PRW or the ASXL genes might be uh, leading to these different cell types. So you can envision a way where PRC1 could 
place ubiquitin on these balls of uh, uh, proteins in such a way so that you can repress gene two and gene four and gene five, but allowing for activation or expression of gene one and gene three and uh, gene six. And that if you express gene one, th gene three and gene six, some cells will ultimately become the red cell. Whereas if you remove ubiquitin from some uh, nucleosomes or balls of cells by with PR dub, so ASX cells and BAP1, and you move it to other genes, then it will allow gene two, gene four, and gene six to be expressed. And you'll get a, a green cell and you can move them around again and potentially get a purple cell. And um, so what we think may be happening with the, um, when you have a problem with one of the ASXL genes, we think that it's, potentially changing this code in some way. And ultimately that can leave, it can create um, different kind, com, uh, different combinations of genes to be expressed so that ultimately maybe some of those genes decide to become a different kind of cell. So um, I think that uh, that, was, that was a simplification. And if it was that simple, we probably wouldn't need so many people to come together on a regular basis to discuss it. But um, uh, as Amanda already mentioned, we uh, just finished the science symposium that was uh, a couple of days before we started the family conference. And uh, we came together and discussed many aspects of this biology and there were people, many of the scientists there that were represented were looking both at PRC1 and PRW to understand how you can change uh, the, the distribution of these ubiquitins across genes to change different uh, gene transcription. And ultimately, we also spent a lot of time discussing as Amanda and Bianca and Natasha have already uh, discussed, we discussed a lot of the updates to how uh, the different disorders are being uh, um, described and the phenotypes that are being observed. And uh, we also looked into the, some of the science about that underlying some of these clinical assessments that are being used for deep phenotyping. And, understand correlating all of the ways that ASX cells are similar or different is really important for helping us basic scientists to develop hypotheses to uh, better understand the ASX cell proteins. But more importantly, just like in Drosophila, where they use Drosophila, uh, uh, additional sex combs to identify a lot of other genes that work together. By these deep phenotyping assessments, we actually know other disorders that share those same features. And those are important clues for, for basic scientists. So we can go back and generate hypotheses and actually potentially identify novel therapeutic targets that are just related to the ASX cells but may be really important for treating different features. And um, so it comes full circle and we uh, couldn't have all of this uh, organization and this infrastructure without the help of the R Foundation. So we're very grateful and in, indebted to their many efforts. And with that, I will take questions.